Hi, I'm Pete Hammond, and welcome to uh, Scene at the Academy, uh, where we get to analyze uh, one or two scenes here from a movie that you have seen that are on the Academy uh, uh, screening uh, room. Um, and today it's Greyhound, a terrific film here. We're going to be talking about that film with four of the key players here. First off, it's star and screenwriter here, Tom Hanks. Hi, Tom. Guilty. <laughs> And uh, another Academy Award winner, a fine director, Get Low. You may have seen that. Not guilty. <laughs> and speaking of speaking of cinematographers, uh, multi honored by the ASC with many of his uh, projects, television, movies, uh, so many different things. And that's Shelley Johnson. I I, th I think I was acquitted. I think. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> And then a uh, two-time Oscar-nominated costume designer for Frida and 12 Monkeys, and that is Julie Bice. Hi, Julie. Well, hello. I plead temporary insanity. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, great to be part of this company. And boy, I'll tell you, we have seen so many different movies. You've made a few of them yourself, Tom, you know, but this is a war that keeps delivering to Hollywood, as it were, there are many stories, and this is one that's really never been told. Well, I would say it's because um, it's not a genre piece per se. That um, any any movie worth its salt from any that is written from about any period of time isn't going to work if it only celebrates the nostalgia for the moment. This is about human beings standing on a bridge for the better part of thirty six hours dealing with one damn thing after another. Yes, there is very specific procedure that is there, naval procedure, you know, convoy procedure, what have you. But what there really is, is a, an inclusivity for the audience to ponder, how did human beings get through that? And the bigger question, I think, that is what I always look for in, in a movie, just when I'm sitting down at home watching it, is what would I do if I was in that circumstance? How would I get by that in that circumstance? Then the wow factor, which is wow, I didn't know that. Um, it, that it is, uh, is demonstrated even in this first sequence that we're talking about, in which there is danger out there, a submarine that we never see. In fact, we don't see anything. Uh, Krauss doesn't see anything. The crew doesn't see anything. The audience doesn't see anything. And yet there that danger lurks. And I think primarily we all, we all react to that circumstance. We all react to that danger because we've had that kind of like spider sense tingling in a circumstance where danger is about. We're not sure where it is. Guard, sir. sir, he's going hard left. Right, standard rudder. Right, standard rudder, aye, aye, sir. All right, stay sharp. Rapid maneuvers, let's plot it. Aye, aye, sir. Contact indefinite, no high sir. Reports contact indefinite, no propeller noise. Contact for 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 Contact bearing starboard 012, range 600 yards, sir. Mr. Lopez, stand by with a medium pattern. Men and ready, sir. Contact bearing port 001, Center range 500 yards. Contact bearing port 001, range 500 yards, sir. Contact bearing 001, range 400 yards. Contact bearing port 001, range 400 yards, sir. It's going dead slow, sir. Contact bearing dead ahead, range 300 yards, sir. 
Contact inside minimum sonar range. Contact inside minimum sonar range, sir. Hydrophone strong, very strong. Hydrophone strong, very strong, sir. Over revving screws. Over revving screws, sir. He's trying to slip under us. Now, Mr. Lopez. Roll on fire, medium pattern. Roll on fire. Um, Aaron, so. You guys chose this particular scene, opening scene. It's worthy of Hitchcock, I got to tell you, you know, in terms of uh, the way the uh, suspense is built here, uh, just like Tom says, the unseen uh, here. So can you talk about it? Take us through uh, this particular scene, and we'll talk to uh, each of you about from your point of view of it. It's a, it's a good example of the overall challenge to a movie uh, from the point of view of a destroyer captain, and as Tom mentioned, the unseen enemy. You essentially have a game of cat and mouse going on, but unlike a, a classic cat and mouse game, as a director, I can't see the mouse. All I have is an empty ocean surface. This mouse is scurrying to the left and Krauss chases it, then it scurries to the right and he re-steers and the audience needs to understand that. And so one of the things that Tom and I did to help convey that was uh, insert it into Krauss's body language. As Krauss is getting those rudder commands and being made aware that it's moved here and then here, his body language is shifting back and forth. So we used Krauss himself as a sort of a visual indicator of what was going on. And this, this such is the challenge when you're making a movie about, you know, cops chasing robbers, but you can't you can't cut to the robbers out the front windshield of the of the cop car, right? And then, of course, Tom's performance is the conduit for all of this tension. It's the focal point. Tom's staring out those portals at nothing but equipment and, and white screen. So it was a big job for all of us to take an, a virtual world and a world that no one really understands because they haven't seen this kind of thing before and make it accessible for an audience. As soon as I saw those round portholes, when I went to visit uh, uh, either the case in Young that is up in Boston, or it was the kid itself that is in uh, Baton Rouge, I was flabbergasted that it, it, it essentially the size of a washer dryer, you know, it's like the bridge kind of looks like a laundromat. There's like these, these small round windows, and that's the only purview that he has of what is out there unless he goes outside. So even the smallness of what you what light comes in and what you do get you, you do get to see belies the fact that there is there is this very very malevolent creature that is out there and so the um, you match that up with from a, from an actor's point of view which is this is the very first time Krauss has come across this in in reality theory gone training gone. Though that's ancient history. What this is the first sub that he has come across, and he can't see it. That sub is going to either sink him or wreak havoc with uh, with his protected flock, <clears throat> and he can't see it. He knows it's out there. He can hear it, sort of. He can get the re reports of kind of like, well, it's over there. Oh no, it's not. It's over there. It's going this fast. Now it's going a little bit slower, and just just that alone. Gets allows me as an actor to play a type of uh, mixture of fear, anxiety, blended in with a small degree of confidence. But more than anything else, I think there is that very, very human and recognizable emotion of not wanting to fuck this up, pardon my language, not wanting to make the mistake that is going to lead to death, destruction, and his own humiliation. <laughs> that's an awful lot to put into one thing, but that's what uh, that's what was in the screenplay as as adapted. And one of the things I admired about the screenplay, the writer per se is not is counting on the actor to uh, convey the focal point emotionally of the scene. And the first thing that came to my mind when I read it was that scene in Close Encounters where the, the airport traffic controller is speaking with a captain over the radio about seeing a, a UFO. You don't cut to the captain, you don't cut to a UFO, it's all centered on this radio control operator. The room, the language, I think that's, for me anyway, what makes it so thrilling and terrifying is that you can just, even though you don't understand it, you know you're in an environment that feels absolutely authentic and you're almost digging 
for the for the drama and tension underneath it. You feel it more than the scene is speaking it. You know, as an actor, I, I look at that and I realize there's only five people that have lines in that scene. Yeah. And most of the lines are repetitions of the lines that have just been said. Yeah. And so we have actors there as a sonar man, a helmsman, the talker, me, and um, uh, the officer of the deck, whose name I can't quite remember right now, but uh, forgive me. But um, th those have to be really good faces. I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a selfish competitive actor. I love, I love having big friggin' close-ups. I like that. But without those other faces or without those other guys saying delivering their lines with the import and the impact and the same sort of confidence of procedure and training um, that anybody would have in that, that um, you, you, you don't have the Cracker Jack scene that's there. And the other requirement is that Shelley has to shoot the living daylights out of it in a way that is gonna make all those pieces fit together. So many scenes from the back, from the front, with the windshield in, with the windshield out, close but you know where you can see the the beeping sonar screen or what have you man there's an awful lot of elements that that went in that for dialogue wise is a bunch of repetitions of the same line uh without all those without all those things coming in um you, you don't have the building blocks for something that is as hyperkinetic as it is that's amazing shelly talk about that yeah and that particular challenge and most of this is handheld it is it, the the entire movie's handheld and and um, the it's interesting because as they're saying you know when you're reading the script, you know as a cinematographer you're, you're looking at your scene and you and you're you know you're 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 trying to figure out what parts of the narrative you can bring out visually you know well in this script because because of the procedural nature of the dialogue, so much of it's left to interpretation, and my own interpretation and conversations with Aaron and I kind of expanded a, an even wider interpretation of it. And, and, uh, uh, but when you finally see the actors do it on the set with each other, well, that's when it, you really start to understand what the, what the scene is about and, and, um, not really about the dialogue at all, but about the situation. And so a lot of what we were trying to pursue was, uh, this is happens early in the film was actually giving the audience a position as though they're standing in the pilot house and, and eavesdropping. So some of these angles where we have, where we're kind of, you know, almost three quarter behind Tom eavesdropping on him, but seeing his eyes and seeing him strategize. I mean, what, one of the things that strikes me about this scene, there's so many strategic moves. You're thinking about where you can put the camera to put that audience right there next to Krauss. And that was fun. It's amazing. And Julie, you get to see your costumes for the first time there and uh, talk a little bit about that and, and what went into doing basically what is what some people would call a uniform kind of movie assignment here for a costume designer. Well, the word uniform is um, in a theosaurus, it would probably say uniform, something that is specific. And I do believe that. I believe that in a uniform, it defines, there's a dignity in it, there is a position. And for Tom Hanks becoming Krauss, there is a level and a definition. And watching that happen, that uniform is extremely important. It is something that needs to be followed and the fitting, watching Tom become Krauss, that is part of why certainly I am a costume designer. To see an actor merge, knowing when to stop, that, that's very hard. Uh, let's talk about the final scene, which um, is so emotional for the audience, but you don't you don't try to get that. It's just there. It's just so natural. And so much of it played on your face, Tom. Well, it's the moment where he's relieved of his command without so much as, uh, well, he gets a little bit of job well done to it. But at the end, it's like procedure takes over. Okay, we're here now. Okay, so you're you're done. Um, so what do you do? Well, I guess he's going to try to go, to go downstairs and try to go to bed. Mr. Carling, she's all yours. I'll be in my cabin if you need me. Aye, aye, sir.
this is the first scene that Aaron talked about um, when we first met about uh, him directing. And it, the, 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 I think the worst, the, uh, a, a director's worst nightmare is having to meet with an actor who has written his own material. <laughs> that's, that's, got, that's just like fraught with, there's one pitfall after another that's gonna go along in there. But um, the first thing that he, the, ver the very first thing that he mentioned was um, when Krauss is relieved of his command. And to hear that from a director who say, he's, al he's already talking about my interior process. He's, always, he's already talking about the ultimate, the ultimate moment of an arc for me as an actor when it's all done and I've got nothing left, nothing left to do. Everything up to that point has led to a moment of what? All right, I guess I'll go back down and if you need me, I'll be in, uh, I'll be in my quarters. Um, I, I, look, I get, I get knocked out by that kind of stuff because I can sort of like hear the French horns, but I did not take into account um, what, what Aaron saw to it is in, in which is the, the pondering of, of everybody on board, on board that, that bridge and, uh, that is matched with now the uselessness of the commanding officer. And then he also saw to it that we added these other moments of uh, Krauss coming down, hearing the cheering coming out, realizing that Greyhound as, uh, as, a, as an escort and a protector, and therefore Krauss as its commander is getting a massive, I could get, I could well up just talking about it right now, mm -hmm. is, getting, is getting a thank you so very much for what you just did with him. When, when you just get to see it and you don't have to talk about it, when no one says, hey, they really like the job we did, Skipper, where it's just plays off in the visuals and in the eyes, uh, that, that goes beyond uh, 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 writing on, on a page. It, it ends up being just pure cinema. And when you, <laughs> that's the best kind of movie you can have is when you, you see it without any explanation, you know exactly what is going through the heart and the mind and the soul of, uh, of the characters. All in, all brought in, it, it ended up being this kind of moment that took me by surprise when I saw when I saw it at the end. I thought, okay, it'll be a nice goodbye. There, there, Krauss is, and he still got his he still got his dress blues on from the funeral. He still looks like a million bucks. It all ends up playing in a way that is not uh, it's not necessarily visual, but it certainly is ephemeral, and that ends up being very powerful. Yeah, well. I have to say, it's fascinating to hear these scenes as they're created, and congratulations to all of you, uh, and joining us here on Scene at the Academy for dissecting that and, uh, and telling us more about this terrific film. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Good to thank see you, you. Shelley. Good to see you, Julie. Good to see you, thank Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. See you, man. <laughs>